start recording on this deal here. So we're going to record on three different places and we're getting going right now. Let's see if I can do this right. Oh. <laughs> And this is my Secular Sobriety, and I am your host, John, and I am here with my co-host, Ben, and we oh. have a guest, our first guest for the podcast, Steve Berenger, and Steve is a facilitator for Smart Recovery. How are you, Steve? Doing fine, thanks. And it's been a while since I've talked to you. I think the last time I talked to you was probably three, four years ago, maybe. I think so. Yeah. And uh, you are our very first guest. So thank you very much. So I thought, I thought what, what I would like to do is have an, a little conversation with you about SMART, the actual program. Um, I, I took the time today to read the, um, the SMART manual and I went through the four points. And I thought that maybe we could kind of go through that. Would, would, would that work for you? Sure. Um, yeah. So so I guess to introduce SMART for people who aren't familiar with it, why don't you do that for us, Steve? Tell us what SMART is. Sure, sure. Uh, SMART Recovery is a, um, <clears throat> a program that uh, started in 1994. It was based on uh, cognitive behavioral principles developed in, you know, through the 50s uh, prior to that by uh, Albert Ellis and, uh, and those folks. Uh, and uh, a group of uh, addiction counselors decided to uh, apply these principles for the purposes of addiction recovery. And so SMART was founded. Uh, you could say it was preceded a bit by uh, a thing called rational recovery. Um, uh, but I was wondering about that. Was SMART did, was formed. Did it start from rational? Did it start from rational recovery, and then did they just kind of um, break off from them, or did they just absolutely change from? Uh, it, it changed from. I, I believe it was more the ideas of rational recovery were adopted by the early founders. Okay. And uh, applied to uh, recovery uh, purposes. Okay. And you know, I was reading actually on the website there the five-year plan for smart recovery. And one thing it said on there is the the number of smart meetings has actually tripled in the last five years. And I also noticed that where I live here in Kansas City, there are more smart meetings than there were the last time that I spoke with you about four years ago. Are, are you seeing that growth also? Yes, it, it is slow. Like last time we spoke, I think I was the only smart facilitator in our county. I had the only meeting. Now mm. there are uh, seven of them. Yeah. So, so it, it's it's grown here. Oh, that's pretty good. But so, part of the reason for the the slow growth is the facilitators have to go through a six week online training course, and uh, you know that co costs a hundred dollars. Mm. Although there are scholarships available mm -hmm. for people who want to do it who can't afford it. So. Um, you know, it's it's not as easy as starting some other meetings. Right. You just can't go in with a, a church basement and a coffee pot and, and start. But, you know, that, that's actually yeah. kind of nice to have that training, because what you're dealing with here is um, science based um, techniques. And yeah, so that, that's correct. That's correct. The um, we do try to follow, uh, like I said, the, the CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy techniques, which were sort of uh, researched a lot and scientifically established. And smart recovery, as the science evolves, the uh, program itself evolves. Yeah. So the four points, and these are not steps. <laughs> these are the four points in smart. <laughs> And I guess they don't really have to be done, done sequentially, but as I was reading the book, it seemed to me like it was kind of a natural progression as, as you recover, um, how, how you go through these points. But the four points are building and maintaining motivation, coping with urges, managing thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, and living a balanced life. Can you go through those for us, um, Steve, and maybe you know, talk about sure. building and maintaining motivation? 
Okay. Yeah, the, the four points are, uh, again, you can work on them all simultaneously or, you know, have you, the, the first two, building and maintaining motivation and coping with urges is probably more important for newcomers, people new to the program and fresh out of uh, rehab or, or starting recovery. The uh, managing thoughts, feelings, and behaviors and uh, lifestyle balance are probably more important later. But uh, one of my emphasis um, is, is I tend to uh, advise people to um, start putting their lives back together right away. Mm -hmm. You know, that would be more the um, lifestyle balance and, and things. Oh, okay. Uh, many people come into recovery with um, damaged family relations and financial problems, and all, you know, all kinds of issues. And um, I, I, you know, it's just my opinion that if, as you put those together, you build a, um, uh, a base of, you know, support amongst, you know, family and friends and things. So yeah, I, that makes I, sense. Maybe emphasized earlier, but, um, you know, many people in, in early recovery have problems, uh, you know, building and maintaining motivation, you know, uh, Perhaps uh, the general interest listener could understand it more as um, trying to diet. You know, you're trying to lose some weight. And, um, and again, SMART will accept people with eating disorders. Mm -hmm. But, uh, um, you know, it's awfully hard to maintain that motivation when there are not dire consequences right away. Like I could go out and grab a banana split right now and, you know, no problem. I feel fine tomorrow and stuff, but do that every day. And, and, and so it's difficult to maintain the motivation to, uh, you know, avoid the banana split. So with a person with some drug or alcohol, uh, substance disorder, uh, you know, it's easier to sort of point out the consequences of, you know, getting mm -hmm. hammered tonight. Right. But even then, it's it's sometimes hard to maintain the, the motivation. I like the exercise of looking at the hierarchy of values. You know, where where you go through, you you ask yourself, what are my values? What's important to me in my life? You know, my family is important to me. My marriage is important to me. My job is important to me. And then you ask the person, is your drinking important to you? Is that a value? Is your is your use is your um, addiction a value? And then you see how that addiction is actually, you're actually betraying your values through your addiction. Yeah, mo most people as, you know, before they get into trouble with, with uh, alcohol or drugs, and, and again, it's often a very gradual process. They've had their hopes and dreams and things they wanted to do with their life, be it good job, education, whatever. And, and many times, these things have all suffered from uh, the substance misuse. And um, often by pointing that out, that as, as, if they may, you know, really value these other things and put, you know, intoxication or being, uh, you know, having fun drinking should be very, very low on their value list. And uh, unfortunately, for someone who is actively drinking or using, um, you know, the, the hierarchy of values is totally flipped. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the only thing that's important to them and everything else is a distant second. Ben, did you use something like that when you were um, a therapist? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think your first job as a th uh, counselor or a therapist is to, to see where somebody's at on their motivation for change and then try and at the very least get them get them, you know, acknowledging that they have the issues so that they can even be a part of the fight. Um, Steve, I had a question. I, I guess this is my naive, naivete about SMART because I haven't been to a meeting. It's been years and years I'm going to say I'm going to go to a SMART meeting and I haven't gone, but it, it makes me think that because something like a 12-step meeting is often required legally or so many people are 
told to go to a 12 step meeting who maybe don't really hardly have any motivation to change at all besides everybody else telling them to, do you find that people that, that start going to smart or do they tend to be a little bit further along the motivation line when they first get there? You know, we, we have our share of people coming in on, uh, you know, court cards or some other form of uh, coercion. Um, and again, there are various levels of, of you know, motivation and willingness. Uh, I, I tend to be very straightforward. And if they're just there to get a court card signed, I'll often get that out of them right away. And, um, and, and we'll talk, it says, you know, and, and sometimes that happens. People feel they were, you know, they got a DUI unjustly or whatever. They just made a mistake and they don't have a problem otherwise. Uh, and I say, well, that's fine. Uh, you know, just I always throw in the little caveat is if these mistakes keep happening, you know, maybe it's time to reassess <laughs> right. you know, what, what's going on. Um, yeah, I, I ran a meeting once for all uh, young men uh, in their, you know, 20s, early 20s to late 20s. And, uh, you know, none of them wanted to quit drinking. And they all got in trouble. And, you know, that's basically all I could really do. That, you know, okay, here, here's uh, the deal. If you just keep making the mistakes, you know, consider coming back. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes that's the only seed that needs to be planted for the future. And that's all you can do. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I like <clears throat> these people to come in because I'll, I'll sometimes we'll really try to dissect what happened and you know smart also uses a thing they call motivational or um yeah motivational interviewing mm -hmm. um where um you'll sort of press them well why do you think that police officer he you know pulled you over and and they can admit yes i was weaving or you know they really were putting other people in danger and and sometimes just uh uh, getting them to realize that makes an impact on them. So. Yeah. Then the, another point, the second point is coping with urges. And that was, that was kind of interesting reading, reading through that. Um, I had, I had some difficulty with it, I guess, but um, Oh, that's just because there was a lot of, a lot of information in there. Um, I guess that what I was getting out of it is that you take a look Okay, the whole idea is that these urges, we have this feeling that these urges are so unbearable that we've got to satisfy them. But the but that discomfort is just a normal part of being a human being. And what we need to do is train our, our minds to somehow be with that dis discomfort. And there is a strategy that you employ to do that. And they call it the deads. And right. can, can you help me with that? Because I might not be understanding all of that the way that it was laid out okay well um you know urges are um you know from our arise from our midbrain if, if we're habituated to alcohol or drugs <clears throat> the same areas of our brain responsible for thirst and appetite you know survival basic survival instances they're, they're the same parts of your brain that to alcohol cravings or uh, drug cravings. So it's a, it's a very difficult thing to deal with. And uh, people will often have that same feeling of dread with the urge that, you know, you have if you're starving. And, um, and so it's very hard to resist. Now, what, in SMART, what we'll try to do is... Uh, one, get people to realize that, that yes, it's a cr craving and maybe uncomfortable, but it's not, um, you're not going to die. You're not going to starve <laughs> to death, you know? And, and, um, uh, and unfortunately, that's, that's a thing you can, you know, again, that's a cognitive thing. Right. You know, the feeling is the same as though you're starving. And, uh, but that's a primitive feeling. And, um, if you get people to make that association and if, if they, if, you know, one is urges 
uh, pass if you just ignore them or mm-hmm. you know, deal they with do them pass. for a while. They just naturally fade away. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, the DEADS is a way to um, deal with it. And the DEADS stands for uh, delay, escape, uh, <clears throat> you, you know, the, the different um, uh, things. Like, for instance, if, uh, you know, the D, you know, the, set, the second D they call distraction. In other yeah. words, if you get an uh, urge, distract yourself, you know, go out for a walk or, or do something, you know, um, and often uh, it'll just help you deal with it until it passes naturally on its own. Um, you know, E is escape. Let's say if you're at a party, yeah. you start getting a lot of urges, just leave, you know, yeah. um, because there are triggers, there are there are there are things that will trigger us in our in our desire to use, and right. so the whole idea is that yeah you you can you know hopefully identify these triggers and learn to either avoid them or be with or be with them and adapt through them. Well, I think one of the great things about SMART too is that it, with the CBT is it acknowledges the thought and gets people. Because I think a lot of people in the early going feel those cravings or those urges and it's, they don't even process it. It's just a feeling. And then you stop and you slow it down a little bit and then say, okay, what led up to this? What's going on? And then what can we do now and move forward? I think getting people to slow down that process and realize even if you don't know it, there is a whole lot of quick, impulsive thoughts going on that are leading to that feeling in there somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one, one way I, I try to explain it uh, sometimes at meeting attendees is you can think of an urge, like we suppress urges all the time. You know, let, let's say the, the, the boss yells at you or something and you get right. upset and you want to stomp your feet and say, screw this job and, and right. walk out. But then you sort of step back, think for a minute and go, oh, wait a minute, I need this paycheck, right. I need this job, <laughs> you know? And, you know, yeah, the, bir- the the boss can be a jerk, but, you know, normally this job is pretty good. So, so we, we suppress that urge to storm out and quit. So our brains really can uh, suppress urges or deal with urges all the time. And, and I think if you look at your daily life, you probably yes. do that a lot. And but, then as you, oh, as you get the practice of doing it, you just get better at it. And then and also the right. urges come less frequently, don't they? over time yeah as your brain sort of heals from from you know they, they, they think your brain gets kind of rewired with the, you know habituation to a drug or alcohol and as you, the more you stay away from it the more that corrects mm-hmm. it can take months or years and people can have cravings you know indefinitely but they do tend to get you know less frequent they're shorter uh, they don't seem as awful uh, and they're easier to deal with. I also so, noticed in the yeah. manual, it talked about, you know, people, you, you go to your support group, your smart support group, and you can talk about these triggers, these situations that trigger your urges. And I read in there that one um, tool that you could use in a smart meeting is role playing. Do you guys, do you ever do that with your group where you role Not play? Rarely, but, I, but I have done that. Like one of the other uh, tools for coping with urges, they call it the disarm tool. Mm. I don't know if you read that in the book, but it, it, it stands for um, uh, <clears throat> detect, basically detect your uh, addict voice in the background. Mm. Okay. One of the things that happens when we're habituated to an alcohol or drug is uh, especially if, if we had sort of a long period leading up to it, is our brain learns to make excuses or rationalize our behavior. And uh, we, we're often very good at that uh, before we get in trouble or, or you know, um, we get into recovery. And so what happens is your, your brain sort of, your, you get urges and things like and, and your brain will sort of kick in and start making those excuses and rational rationalizations again. Like I, I can just have one. I know it. There, you know, whatever you tell yourself, or I deserve a break today, or whatever. 
Um, so, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's like this destructive imagery and, and self uh, recognition. So, so basically when you recognize that voice is kicking in, you have, um, you have counter voices at, on the ready to get go. And I'll, and, you know, I guess a simple way to think about it is the old uh, metaphor of, you know, the devil on one shoulder yeah. whispering in the air and the angel on the other, trying to, trying to talk you out of, you know, taking a drink. And I'll often assign different roles for different people. And, you know, okay, you're, you're the devil today. And, mm -hmm. you know, what, what did you tell yourself last time, you know, yeah. you took a drink? And, and uh, then I'll, someone else will say, what would you say to that if, you know, the devil told you that? Well, how would you respond? And, uh, you know, the angel might say something like, well, last time I drank, I ended up with a cop with a boot on my neck, you know, in yeah. jail. So, so uh you know, it's a good way for people to kind of look at both sides mm -hmm. of an issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think that type of role play can work great. I think in a treatment setting, people are so resistant to it because everybody feels so goofy doing it. And I suppose it's like that in a smart recovery meeting too. But man, people really get into it if you do it. And then uh, the participants usually have so much fun trying to come up with all the stuff to throw the person off too that that it becomes a nice group bonding activity too. Yeah, and I, and I think um, one of the things that makes it better is to have these things sort of on the tip of your tongue when the next urge, because the next urge can come out of nowhere, you know, uh, and, and if you have these things on the tip of your tongue or, you know, ready to go, uh, it's very helpful. Hey, Steve, tell me about the group dynamics a little bit. For example, do... Um, do, do members kind of, uh, of, of the group, do they kind of bond together and do they, do they talk with each other outside of the group? Would it be, would it be acceptable? Like if you are having an urge or a problem that you could call someone in the group? Yeah. So yeah, we do exchange, you know, phone numbers and things sometimes, um, you know, we're not big enough that we have, um, like big group activities, mm -hmm. you know, like, like you know, <laughs> like AA had a chili cook-off, <laughs> you know, so it's a big dance, and, whatever. Know, they, they took over a park, you know? right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, we, we encourage, um, you, you know, having uh, some sober, sober friends as a uh, support group, you know, although we don't have any sort of formal opinion on outside relationships right so it's up to the individual and, and we don't have sort of like a formal sponsorship program or anything right like which i think is smart actually smart yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but speaking of that too um i was reading i think on the, actually the website about some of the principles behind smart and confidentiality being obviously one of those and the enforcement mechanism behind that is if you break someone's confidentiality, you could actually be asked to just leave the group. Yeah. So that is taken true. pretty seriously. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it, you know, I think it should be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. But I find it, what I find interesting about that is, you know, the 12 step programs enforce it through the concept of anonymity and the whole anonymity thing has more to do, I think with um, public relations but what I find, what I found kind of refreshing from SMART is they were actually saying, hey, we encourage you, go out, tell the public about SMART. Do you, is, that, is that the message that you get from SMART that we, we don't mind if you go out there and talk about SMART publicly? Yeah, to, to the best of my knowledge, yeah, they, they like promotion. They like it. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I thought, I, anyway, I thought that was kind of cool. Cause I'm, I'm kind of familiar, more familiar with the 12 step model and, and that, and I have some, I have some questions about that, but anyway, so the next point is managing thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And this is where you really get in some science stuff, um, rational emotive behavior therapy. Um, and then right. the ABC thing, which, um, 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 Ben was talking about earlier when, before we, you came on. Mm -hmm. You want to go through that? Hello? Sure. Uh, you want to go through that? Can you go through that? <laughs> sure, sure. 
Yeah. The ABCs was uh, uh, actually one of the oldest uh, CBT hmm. techniques that developed like in the, the 50s by Albert Ellis himself. And um, the premise of it is that a lot of our reactions to external events are irrational. Uh, like, for instance, um, let's say let's use the thing where the, the boss yells at you for some reason. And uh, you can react with anger or depression. Uh, these, the reactions to, to things tend to be uh, anger or depression, and both of them can be dysfunctional depending on, on what you do. Uh, let's say for someone who gets depressed, they might feel like, oh, I'm a failure. I could never do the job right. In other words, it really hits, hurts their ego to, to have the boss yell at them. But um, so the, for the ABCs, the A would be the activating event, which is the boss yelling at you. The B would be your irrational beliefs about the event. And um, uh, C would be the consequences. Let's say, you know, you get upset or depressed, or so you, you know, after work, you stop, stop by happy hour and, and get hammered, even though you've been sober for six months, you know, in, in recovery. So uh, episodes like this can often uh, precipitate a, a relapse. And so we try to uh, teach people, uh, you know, how to deal with it. Now, the ABCs also have a D and an E. Yeah, I saw that. And the D, <laughs> <laughs> the D is uh, for disputing those irrational beliefs. Like you might say, uh, instead of, you know, getting depressed or, you know, or feeling in inferior or inadequate, you might say, well, you know, uh, I really didn't do a very good job at that. I'll try to do better next time. And the boss does yell at other people too, and he doesn't pick on me only. And, and uh, you know, I, I really am a pretty good employee otherwise, and, and I'll correct this problem. And um, so thinking more rationally about the uh, activating event can lead to, you know, less depression, less urges to, to relapse, that sort of thing. And the E stands for, you know, effective new, um, new behavior, which would, again, be the, you know, I'll, I'll do a better job next time, and et cetera, et cetera. So how do people go about learning how to, how to employ this in their daily life? Is it just a matter of trying it out and then coming to the group and talking about it? Yeah, it's like a lot of this, to be honest, a lot of these smart tools are a bit of, you know, it's like practice. The more you do right. it, the, the better you get at it. You know, like the, um, uh, we were talking about the disarm tool the more you do it, the, the, the more you have these things at the front of your head next time you get an urge. Mm -hmm. um, the more you think of, um, uh, you know, wanting to drink, but you go through your head about your hierarchy of values and what's really important to you, the easier it is the next time. Mm. You know, it, it's been said every time you resist an urge or, um, you know, correct something irrational with a, a with an ABC that part of your brain gets a little stronger and the part of your brain that you know feels bad about you or wants you to relapse or give into the urge gets weaker so it's very empowering too I think to get people in the habit of questioning that first impulsive thought about you know like you said, A, the action that happens, and then B, the belief about that action, and then C, the consequence. It's like, if you can change the B, you're going to end up with a different result, which is the E in your... So I think getting in that habit is is just huge to say, you know, if somebody was doing therapy for a long time, you might get to a realization where it's like, oh, well, when anybody talks to me in an angry fashion, I tend to go this direction. I need to know that about myself, so I need to question my reaction so that I don't act out in a way that's going to cause me problems. Yeah. Yeah. We, we had uh, uh, one and only one in my five years of doing this, but one gentleman who, who came to a meeting who um, his problem was rage. Mm. He, he was sort of a, a rageaholic and, and, and what brought him in 
was he was in his car, or he actually had a truck, but he was driving down the freeway and somebody cut him off or something happened and he went into a rage and was sort of speeding after the guy, mm. and, you know, yelling at him and stuff. And uh, next thing you know, he looks in his back seat and he's got two little kids crying. Uh. They were just so upset by this. And he says, you know, I, I need to do something. I need to help. Wow. And so, you know, the activating event would be somebody cutting you off. The irrational beliefs is is what made him act like that was, you know, he felt this guy uh, uh, was, I was inferior to this guy, so he felt entitled to cut me off. I was, uh, it, you know, things like that, that uh, it provoked that feeling like, you know, this guy's not giving me a fair shake. And, and uh, so, um you know, a, a dispute of that might be, well, you know, the guy maybe didn't see me. Maybe he just made a mistake himself. And, and uh, maybe he's having a bad day. Who knows? Uh, you know, even if he, he is a jerk, yeah. him behaving this way is increasing my chance of having an accident and hurting my kids. So, um, uh, you know, the more effective behavior was just to kind of, you know, just let it go and make sure you stay safe. So, uh, yeah, the, the ABCs can be very empowering in, uh, you know, changing your behavior. Kind of you remind, reminded me, too, of another another little concept. And I don't know where and under what point it falls under, but the, the car, the, the guy, thinking about the guy in the car reminded me of it. It was um, unconditional acceptance, right? Yeah. So, and it's not just unconditional, it's, it's not unconditional acceptance of other people, but it's of yourself too. It's, it's, it's realizing that I'm a human being, I'm imperfect and other people are imperfect. It's, it's, it was just kind of a nice little read when I was reading that, that in the manual, I thought well, that's, that's something that I could, I could see myself using as, is re- just reminding myself that it's okay to, you know, to act like that, Yeah. you know, yeah. it's normal to get pissed off a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, you know, they, they, they have, two things they call it usa unconditional self-acceptance and um uoa unconditional other acceptance and um yeah it's it's to realize um yeah you're imperfect but also other people are too and that you know except the you know we tend to get upset when other people don't behave the way you know we are we're expecting or we Mm -hmm. want them to Mm -hmm. Now, if we could go into the fourth point, this is one that actually I, I need to work on. And it was about living a balanced life. And I would really like for you to talk about this a little bit. There are some things that I found very interesting. First of all, the pie chart where you, where you look at your, I guess your values and, and if you're in balance, but also the importance of finding uh, what they call a vital absorbing creative interest, something that that you're passionate about that you can do in your life. That's, I guess, brings you joy or whatever, but that there's also um, a need to not get even too carried away with those things, which I find myself doing. I I find myself getting involved with a creative interest and find myself getting a little carried away with it. My life gets out of balance. Yeah. Well, I I think, um, Again, you're you're right. The lifestyle balance should be based on, or integrated with your you know hierarchy of values and what's important to you. Um, you know, and, and again, the, uh, the the balance pie means you take so many you know size of wedges to satisfy you know living a balanced life. You know, so many hours for you know good sleep, so many hours for family life, so many hours for friends, so many hours for like self-care, like exercise or, you know, whatever. And um, yeah, and, and, and part of it should be the, the creative interest uh, being, you know, what it is. I, I think uh, it's, it's kind of self-explanatory, but I think one of the things that often leads to uh, relapse, depression, other problems is um, our life's getting way out of balance. And it's one of those things 
that can happen, you know, very subtly, you know, like work might be making more and more demands on your time. And you might get more and more obsessed with, uh, you know, overtime and saving money and that kind of thing. And next thing you know, the family life starts to suffer and, you know, you're, you're drinking or whatever to deal with the stress. And uh, so, so uh, living a, a balanced life is one of the things for sort of maintaining. Again, I, as I mentioned, it's, it's probably something more a little later in yeah, recovery. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I see the four points to me, they were kind of like a natural progression. I, I see in that way. I, I have a be, this habit of seeing things, everything linear. And I, I know that's not how everything in the world is, but that's the way I see things for whatever reason. But, um, but I could, I could just see that linear progression of, you know, you, you, you get motivated, you deal with your urges, you look at your um, behavior patterns and, and learn different ways of behaving. And then you, you have a more fulfilling life that you try to find some balance and, 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 and there's all kinds of, of, of things that go into that. And I just, I just, I mean, I could relate to it. I could see that that being like the recovery process. So how I, how it kind yeah, of seemed to me. Yeah. yeah I, I think there's, you know, a lot more to recovery than just not drinking. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or, or, or using. And, uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of people come into recovery with their, their lives kind of in shambles, right. you know, they alienated their family. They have a lot of financial, legal problems, whatever. And um, it's a process that I think needs to, um, you know, be integrated. I think all these factors need to, to be uh, worked on as you go along. And you know what? A lot of people, to... a lot of people might not know. I didn't know this, but Smart also has an offshoot for family of of people. Right. They call it family and friends. Yeah. So that's and, uh, yeah. Fortunately, locally, we we do have one meeting of family and friends. Mm -hmm. seven, so that's a good thing. I think so because that is, that is a huge that is a huge factor with somebody's recovery is is dealing with their family as they're as they're um, recovering and the family needing to understand it and the person needing to understand what they're doing to their family. It's can yeah, I can see how that's a big piece big piece of all of this. Steve, what I really appreciate too about SMART that I hear over and over is it's about like figuring out what your values are and how to go towards those and figuring out what matters to you and learning how to, how to, you know, make your life work in that, that aspect rather than it's like, it's not prescriptive as in here's what your value should be, or here's what you should be doing. It's like, let's find out what works for you. I, I find that very refreshing because Especially in the twelve-step world, I, I don't always I don't always find that to be true. Yeah, I, I think you know. I, I guess as a therapist, you, you probably know it's best when the, uh, the person uh, in in treatment discovers what's best for them on their own, and, and you might just you know lead them to it without telling them what to do, and uh, uh, that's kind of what we try to do and smart yeah you know because we readily admit that you know everyone's program is probably a little different yeah. and uh one thing's where you know some people want to be musicians others want to be a uh, phd so right so, you know their their lifestyle balance pies are going to look different but uh you know hopefully they'll stay sober you know yeah smart is also very upfront about a lot of things that i think are important they were upfront about um uh supporting pharmacological uh, scientifically based pharmacological treatments for addiction that uh, you know that that's that's fully supported um and i think it was important to talk about that and there's a few other things i just can't remember that i thought that they made it they, they were just they it was wise to be out front about some of these things, you know, that, you know, you're, you're free to, to create your own, you know, do what works for you basically, you know? Right. You know, and, and another thing smart tries to do is meet the people where they're yeah. at. You, you know, um, a lot of people come in just questioning, <clears throat> you know, we don't have a requirement that you, you, you have to be sober to be, you know, be here right but, uh, the only you know the you define whether or not you want to be there 
And uh, even if you're just questioning or just wondering and, and want, you know, other people's opinion, you know, that's fine too. And uh, it, anything that gives uh, these people a little insight or, you know, let, let them discover where they're at, you know, can be helpful. We don't insist everybody stay forever and ever in meetings and just have one goal. It's just, uh, uh, you know, meet them where they're at and, you know, help them out. Seems a lot more inclusive and welcoming than some of the places I know as far as those philosophies and just, like you said, meeting people where they're at and saying, hey, if you want to come here sometimes, do. If you don't, don't. If, you know, there's not a prescription that's going to work for everyone. Well, we can yeah. do a, a, another couple of episodes on SMART because there's a whole other online component that they have too, which is absolutely incredible. You know, they have online meetings, they have um, chat rooms, um, and from what from what I said on the website, it's pretty much always accessible. Um, then, of course, you have the training that you can talk about that you go through to be a smart facilitator. I mean, there's a lot of lot of meat to this. There's a lot of substance behind all of this. And one thing I did want to ask you, Steve, before we leave, do you know how all of this was put together? How they wrote this this manual? What would they do? Did they did they go to the experts? At, and ask, you know, what, what components should we add to this program? How did this happen? No, to be honest, I think it was just the uh, therapist at the beginning, mm -hmm. you know, uh, like Tom Horvath and, uh, uh, you know, there, there are several people who, therapists who just sort of got together, put their heads together and, you know, let's give people some other alternative. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I didn't realize that. So it was actually started by people who were trained therapists. Yeah, no, it's going to be, um, let's see, Joe, like Gerstein, Joe Gerstein, he's actually, a, you know, an MD sort of addiction medicine specialist. Uh, most of the other ones are, you know, uh, therapists, PhDs, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, to qualify, about, uh, on average, about 50% of smart facilitators are also degreed in something else. I was wondering about, are you, are you like a no. therapist? No, okay. So no, you're a total layperson. Lay, uh, I'm a lay layperson facilitator. Wow. Never would have guessed. Uh, but, but, but some are, uh, yeah, some are like MFCCs and, you know, uh, stuff like that. And another like cool person. thing too, you don't actually have to have had an addiction problem to be a smart facilitator. Correct. And it's really interesting. You read the, you read it. I can't remember if it was in the manual or if it was on the website where it's read about the principles. I think it's on the website. It says, we found that it really doesn't really matter. And, and it shouldn't matter. Yeah. It really shouldn't matter. It, it, it really shouldn't. I, I think, you know, to, to be honest, most of the people I know who are not substance abusers, who are uh, smart facilitators are the degreed people. Okay. Okay you know, the psych social workers, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, and the one thing I should mention is, is uh, a person in that category can often take the course and get um, continuing education. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. And a lot of them will, uh, you know, host meetings because, you know, as you know, the therapists deal with people with substance problems all the time. And it's a, it's a very common problem. And so, um, you know, it helps to have that under their belt, even if they don't. Sure. Well, before we let Steve go, um, Ben, do you have any questions or anything you want to mention? No, I mean, I, I said, I never would have guessed Steve, I would have anticipated you were a therapist or a counselor. So you've, yeah, it sounds great. I mean, uh, yeah, really appreciate you joining us. Well, I, I uh, got my degree in the University of Adversity. <laughs> <laughs> well, Steve, I, again, thank you so much for coming on here to be our very first guest. Um, I want to have you back on again, because like, like I say, there's a lot of substance to this. There's a lot to smart yeah. recovery. I mean, we just barely touched the surface here. I mean, you could spend a whole episode on just one of these points. You can talk about the training. Oh, gosh, all kinds of stuff. I was really fascinated with it as I as I read the manual and read through the website. So thank you very much for, for well, doing well, this. If you, want, if you want to do some podcast in the future with a focus on something or other, just, you know, let me know. I absolutely will. So I'm going to play right. some music to get us out of here. That's not the right music. <laughs> I'll have to learn the, the right button one of these days. So anyway... 
thank you for listening to and watching my sec my secular sobriety that's what it's called yeah thank you and thank you steve and that oh, thanks that's steve. A wrap. All right, we'll see you guys all right that was fun thank you very much thanks steve so nice we're to already meet you on youtube <laughs>